So I mentioned earlier, we're going to start a brand new series today. It's entitled Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Okay, um, so I'm guessing that, um, that that phrase, emotional health, probably produced um, one of two responses inside of your head just now. The first one is like, ah, oh, why are we talking about this in church, right? And then the others of you are like, wait, why haven't we talked about this before in church, right? So there's probably both sets of responses in the room as we talk about the idea of emotional health. And the reality is it's because um, in many churches throughout the United States, there, it's kind of like a polarizing event, is it not? Like this, this concept of emotionality, emotional health. And I think what happens in many of the churches throughout the United States, there's either one or of two responses. Either there's like this hyper-focus on emotions in the context of the church, or... We wind up ignoring emotions entirely. Much like the responses that you just gave, right? Like, why are we talking about this in church? Well, for the next six weeks, we're going to spend some time together talking about emotional health. And I want to give you a couple of reasons for that. Uh, First one is I've heard it said that uh, we are dealing with an emotional health crisis in our culture. An emotional health crisis in our culture. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. I just saw a research um, report from the Kaiser Family Foundation. It's a nonprofit organization that is responsible for helping to um, keep the Americans informed about our overall health. So it was just four days ago they came out with the results. And what they discovered is that anxiety and depression has risen, has tripled three times in one year. It's tripled. It went from 11% in January of 2019 to 41% in just over a year. And that's not the only kind of indicator of an emotional health crisis in the context of our church. The report goes on to say that 36% of adults reported struggling with sleep issues. Either they can't get up or they can't go to sleep. Does that sound anything like what you've experienced? 32% are experiencing issues with eating. Either they eat too much or not enough. 18% of Americans are experiencing uncontrolled outbursts of anger. Substance abuse is tragically on the rise in the context of our culture. And this is the one that um, burdens my heart most. It's that the younger the generation, the more likely that they are dealing with things like anxiety and depression and mental health issues. So for the millennials and younger Gen Z, they're well over 50% of millennials and Gen Z are dealing with anxiety and depression on a regular basis in their lives. Tripled in just a year. And the truth is, the church hasn't necessarily always done a great job at addressing the issue of emotional health. You see, in in many of the churches I grew up um, in, I don't know your context, but in many of the churches I grew up in, we kind of checked our emotions at the door. And you come in and you kind of like use your head, right? And, and you use your voice, but like your heart, you just kind of leave it at the door and you pick all that mess up when you walk back out to the parking lot, right? But what I'm hoping, what I'm hoping for us this morning is that as we take this journey towards emotionally healthy spirituality, that we will not create like this hyper-focus on emotionality, nor will we ignore the emotions that we carry as individuals, but that we will have a balanced perspective on emotional health, what God has for us as a church. In fact, the two primary purposes this entire series, number one, is that we would develop a balanced and biblically sound approach to emotional health, but then number two is that we would invite Jesus into our emotional lives. When was the last time you did that? When was the last time you invited Jesus into your emotions? And I want to be really careful here because um, this is not meant to be a self-help type of uh, series, okay? In fact, I, I don't believe that self-help series are, like, should be in the context of the church because John chapter 15, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing, right? Jesus says in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. So I just want to be really careful here. That we're not just um, trying to create a, a really nice self-help series that, um, that give you a couple tips and tricks and then like send you back out and hope, patch you up a little bit and hope you're better. The reality is 
we are trying to invite Jesus into our emotional lives. I mean, think about this for just a minute, okay? We're going to go back to our vision statement I just talked about. That CAC exists to empower people to know and live like Jesus in our church, our community, and the world. Okay, let's just focus on those two words, to know and live like Jesus. Okay, my experience has been, in the context of most churches, that discipleship, knowing and living like Jesus, has three main components, right? Our actions, our words, and our thoughts, right? What we do, what we say, what we think. That's what most churches address in the context of discipleship, knowing and living like Jesus, actions, words, and thoughts. But what about emotions? What about, what about our feelings? When was the last time anyone that you know in the context of any church addressed this issue with regards to discipleship, following Jesus, not just with our heads or our hands or our lips, but with our hearts, with our emotions? This is the journey I'm going to invite you on in this season with me. And it's coming out of um, a particular book. It's called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. It's by Pete Scazzaro. Um, Pete is a pastor in the Christian Missionary Alliance, which is the denomination that we belong to. He wrote this book probably almost 14 years ago. And I want to tell you, I'm not just going to preach the book to you. If you want to get the book, that's up to you. I don't make any sales off of it. There's no money behind it. Um, but what we're going to do together for these next six weeks is we're going to figure out this, this idea of how emotional and our emotional health actually fits into our discipleship process, knowing and living like Jesus. And this particular book has been transformational for me personally because my context, my, my family of origin, I, I didn't necessarily have the greatest language and development theology around what it means to be an emotionally healthy follower of Christ. But there's this one core truth that you're going to hear me say over and over and over again that comes out of this book. And it is that it's impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. The whole premise of the book, the whole premise of the series, is that it is impossible for us to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. But think about how we've described it in most churches, right? Like, if we're ignoring the emotional health of individuals by and large entirely, what we're, we're kind of, the message that we've sent is the exact opposite of this, is that it's possible to have a spiritually mature discipleship relationship with Jesus Christ, to know and live like him without ever engaging our emotions. And so let me ask you a question. What are the core emotions that humans experience? Okay? So um, if you're worshiping with us online, you can put it right down in the comments if you want to. You can send us a message. If you're doing it here, you can shout it out. What are some of the core emotions, the primary emotions that all humans experience? Anybody want to share? Anger. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Happiness. Yep. Any others? Just happiness. To love. Okay. And yep. Fear. Yep. Grief, hmm. Sadness, yeah. So um, part of the reason I think that, um, did I miss one? Joy. Hmm, joy is separate from happiness. Okay, thank you. So one of, the, um, one of the reasons that I think we really need this series, one is because I, I said the church doesn't always do a good job of addressing emotional health, but two, um, the psychological community doesn't have a whole lot of agreement around what the core emotions are. Did you know this? There's as few as four of core emotions, and then I found as many on a different site, 16. So the, the core, four core emotions that like psychologists by and large agree upon as the things that all humans have as part of our like built-in is happiness, sadness, fear, and anger. This is the minimum, Right? That these are the core minimum, and that all other emotions, if you hold to, as a psychologist, now I'm not going to get real deep into this, but as a psychologist, if you hold to the, the principle that happiness, sadness, fear, and anger are the core emotions, they're at the center of who we are as individuals, then all other emotions are a derivation of that, right? They're derivatives of these four emotions. 
But then if you go on, um, some actually add two more. So happiness, sadness, fear, anger, surprise. I didn't know that that could be an emotion. I, apparently, but according to psychology, surprise. Disgust is another one. And yet nowhere on here yet is grief, is there? So we got four core emotions. Happiness, sadness, fear, anger, or maybe it's six. Uh, happiness, sadness, fear, anger, surprise, disgust. Let's try eight. Okay, what if it's eight? Now, this is where they kind of do a parallel, right? So there's four and four. Happiness and sadness, anger and fear, trust and distrust, surprise and anticipation. What if those are the four core, eight core emotions of humanity? See, the reality is for as complex and as smart as humans are, we've got a little bit of work to do with regards to this idea of emotion. So maybe there's four, maybe there's six, maybe there are eight. For today, I'm just going to pick the middle one, and we're going to go six, okay, for the process of our study. But let me ask you an additional question. I ask you, what are the core emotions that humans experience? Let Let me ask you one more. What is emotion? What is emotion? If the four, six, eight core principles of emotions confuse you, don't go looking up this question online. I went, to th- I went to three different dictionaries, and I got three very different primary answers, okay? I went, I, I won't say which ones, but I, you can figure them out. The top three dictionaries that you can find online, I went to each one of those, and their, their primary definitions were so different. Number one, they were different. Number two, they were confusing. Which, again, reveals to me this this idea that we, as individuals, we don't really fully understand emotion. And therefore, we don't understand how our emotions fit into our relationship with Jesus. There is some. Okay, I admitted that there's a whole bunch of different definitions. And um, it's a little bit hard to define itself. But there is some commonality, okay, amongst all the definitions that I found. And it says that uh, there are three main components of emotions, okay? So I may not be able to give you a definition for emotion, but there are three agreed-upon main components. The first one is a subjective experience, okay? Some of you are like, what is that? The reality is it means something happens, either inside of you or outside of you. You experience something as an individual, so something happens. This is what like constitute an emotion. Then there's a physiological reaction. Okay, some of you you get nervous to, to talk in public and your hands get all sweaty, right? And your mouth kind of gets dry. Or, you know, some of you are on this um, this Valentine's Day all excited about your significant other and your heart starts to race, right? So this is the physiological reaction. Like something happens, we see the person we love, and then there's this reaction. Or we see the person we don't necessarily love. Can we use the word hate, right? We we see the person that we don't like, and there's another physiological reaction. So this is all the components of what an emotion is. And then finally, there's some sort of response. How many of you ever tried to like compose yourself in the midst of uh, an emotional response, right? Anybody ever tried doing that one? Where you try to keep your poker face on, you know, you get, like something happens and it hurts or it, it's excited or whatever else it is, and you're trying so hard to just like maintain some composure. That is the, like the three core components of what an emotion is. A subjective experience, a physiological reaction, something happens inside of you, it's kind of a natural response, and then we have a decision to make about our behaviors, how we're going to act in response to what we feel. So maybe there's four Maybe there's six. Maybe there's eight. I can't give you a real good definition, but these are the three primary components of what an emotion is. An external stimulus of some sort, a response that happens automatically inside of us, and then a behavior, like how do we react. These are kind of the core principles of emotions. Okay, so set all that aside. That's all. Psych 101. How long did it take me? Okay, 13 minutes. To give you a Psych 101 class, let's get real for a minute. And let's go back to these, I'll call them these six core emotions. Happiness, sadness, fear, anger, surprise, disgust. And let me ask you a follow-up question. Which of these core emotions make you feel uncomfortable? Which of the six core emotions do you have a tendency to avoid? Do you feel awkward around, right? Which of the ones do you have a hard time expressing? Or do you have a hard time letting other people express when you're around? Happiness, sadness, fear, 
anger, surprise, or disgust? Which of those ones would you say that you're least comfortable with out of these core emotions? So let, let me give you just a little bit of a hint. If there are any emotions on that list that cause you to feel kind of awkward or weird or uncomfortable, either when that happens in yourself or when that happens around you, there's some work that I think needs to happen in the context of your understanding of emotional lives. Because what happens, okay, psychologists, psychologists, uh, sociologists, they, they kind of reinforce for us that what happens as we grow up, our families of origin, and, and also like the people we spend time with, right, those, our, our childhood environments, they, they kind of communicate to us that there are certain safe emotions and unsafe emotions, right? There are certain good emotions and bad emotions. And we, whether we know this or not, we all kind of have this mental list. Like, oh, I don't want to go there. That's a bad one, right? Oh, i, I got to make sure that I can feel that one because that's a good one, right? We as humans, we unknowingly, we develop. Even the most well-adjusted, well-developed young people, they still develop this idea that certain emotions are not safe, are not healthy, are uncomfortable. And this is why, dear friends, that we need to take this journey for this next six weeks or so. Because many of us consider certain emotions to be wrong, don't we? At some point in our lives, we consider them sinful or wrong. And then when we experience them, like we don't necessarily, as followers of Christ, we don't give ourselves permission to experience those certain emotions that we don't like. And therefore, we begin to like stifle the emotions that we carry as individuals. And then we're not inviting Jesus into the fullness of our lives when we do that. We're not inviting Jesus into the fullness of our emotions when we categorize certain emotions as wrong or sinful. So I want to offer you two core principles this morning as we kind of start this journey towards emotional health. The first one is that emotions are not inherently sinful. Okay, I never do this, but I'm going to ask you to do this with me today. Will you say this out loud with me? Emotions are not inherently sinful. Now, do you believe that? <laughs> you just said it outside. Out, like you, you spoke it, but do you believe it? So many of us, we, we kind of hold on to this idea that certain emotions are bad, they're sinful, they're wrong, they're not of God. And yet, okay, so stick with me here. For those of you who have experienced an environment where certain emotions were considered wrong or sinful or unsafe, what really happened, okay, and this is my perspective on it, is that what really happened is that people around you did unsafe things with their emotions. And so therefore, they became unsafe for you because they behaved in ways that made you feel unsafe. But let's, let's do this quick tour, okay? Let me tell you why I believe that emotions are not inherently sinful. And that is because God himself displays the full range of emotion throughout Scripture over and over and over again. Okay, I can't point you to a chapter and verse that says, um, you know, 2 Joshua 2.17, emotions are not inherently sinful. I should make a 2 Joshua. But that, that's not a real book, just so you know. Um, <laughs> I can't take you to a verse that says that, but I can point to you over and over and over again where God, the Father, and Jesus, the Son, they display the full range of emotions in the way that they interact with people. So can we take a, just like a, a brief tour here to get an idea? God expresses happiness in John chapter 15, verse 11. This is, this is Jesus' own words. And John chapter 15, and see what he says. I have told you this so that my stoicness, so that my even keeledness, yeah, thank you. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. John 17, 33 is the next one. Jesus says the exact same thing that, I, that he prays for joy for his followers, right? So Jesus himself not only exhibited joy, but he prays for us to have that same joy. What about sadness? Did Jesus ever express sadness? John eleven thirty five 35 is one of the most powerful verses in all of Scripture. You want to know what it says? Two words. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. 
That's an entire sentence. I mean, that's a paragraph. I mean, that's a, that's a whole book right there. Jesus wept that the Son of God, the King of kings, the Savior of the world, at the loss of his, one of his closest friends, he stood outside of the tomb and openly wept, right? Tears coming down from his eyes, like, you know, the whole thing with your nose and all. Like it, Jesus is weeping. He's not, he just didn't, like, he didn't shed a tear for his friend. He is broken hearted in this moment at the loss of his friend. Jesus wept. Dear friends, I take so much comfort in these two that we have a God, a Savior, who weeps with us. So Jesus demonstrated happiness. Jesus demonstrated sadness. He wept. We know Jesus demonstrated anger, right? This is a real simple one. You go to Matthew 21. It's one of those ones when you're a little kid and they teach you those stories when you're in Sunday school. For those of you who have been there, some of you have never been to Sunday school, so that's okay. When I was growing up in Sunday school, they would teach you all the stories. And one of the stories that made me most uncomfortable was the one about the money changers, right? The one where Jesus is like flipping tables and like going crazy at the temple. That one is like, that freaked me out as a kid. You can tell that anger might have been one of those unsafe emotions for me. Matthew chapter 21, verse 12. Jesus entered into the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the, and the benches of those selling doves. Jesus responds and demonstrates genuine anger. I don't think Jesus walked over like, hi, can I flip your table over? Right? I, I, don't, I don't think Jesus walked over like, hey, that's not a good thing to do with the doves. He was freaking out, right? Like he was, he was so upset about the way that people had treated the temple. That in anger, he responds. And we know that in anger, he did not sin. That Jesus lived a sinless life and died a perfect, sinless death. And so therefore, anger itself must not be wrong, sinful. All right, so we talked about those, those three. Those are the kind of simple core ones, happiness, sadness, anger. Does God ever show any more like complex emotions, right? I mentioned that you take these core emotions and then you kind of mix some of them together and you get the more complex emotions. Is God just kind of myopic, kind of like um, singularly focused on, on four core emotions? Well, the truth is God actually expresses jealousy. Whoa. That seems dangerous, right? That's one of those like emotions that we're like, that, that's probably not good. Jealousy, yep, jealousy's bad. We've been told our whole lives jealousy is bad. But look at, look at how, G, how God describes himself to the people of Israel in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. He says, You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Okay, if jealousy is an emotion, then the emotion itself must not be sinful if God is jealous. What we do with our jealousy, that determines the sinfulness of it. And what we're jealous for, it matters. But God himself says, I am a jealous God. And in case this is just one time you thought he said that, just a couple chapters later, Exodus 34, 14, do not worship any other God for the Lord whose name is, what? Capital J, jealous. Like, that's what it says. God is saying, I am jealous. What? Like, the, God describes, okay, so in, in Genesis and Exodus, especially in this passage, what's happening is um, the, the Israelites have just come out of Egypt. They've been in slavery for hundreds of years. God is walking them through the wilderness. He's establishing a new relationship with this, this new covenant that he's got with Israel. He's reestablishing an old covenant. But, but he's talking about what it means to relate to him as a God, right? And one of the first names he gives to Israel for who he is is the capital J, Jealous, right? I am jealous, says God. So surely, if jealousy is a sin, then it wouldn't be the name of God. The object of our jealousy, the behaviors around our jealousy, that matters. But God himself is a jealous God, desiring that our full hearts and minds and lives be surrendered to him. Okay, what about one more complex emotion? I don't even know if I want to put this one on the screen. It makes me a little, like, twitchy. But what about hate? 
I mean, we, know, we see that Jesus demonstrated happiness and sadness and anger. God the Father demonstrated his jealousy and his relationship with, with Israel. But did God ever hate? Like, okay, be honest. How many of you grew up where you weren't allowed to use the word hate ever? Come on, be honest. Thank you. At least 30% of the room is as messed up as I am, all right? I, I grew up in a family where hate, you could not use the word hate. I hate pickles. Don't use that word, right? Hate was not allowed to, like hate itself was like sin. It was like the fullness of sin itself was hate, right, for the most part in my world growing up. But God, our Heavenly Father, demonstrated hatred. Proverbs 6, 16 and 19 says it this way. There are six things that the Lord doesn't like. That makes me feel better. Six things that God doesn't really think are good, right? No, God is like, he's being dead honest here. He's like, I hate these things. And he lists out seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. You want to hate something? Hate that. Hate that list. But even something as an emotion so complex as hatred, in itself, is not sin. Are you getting the point here? What we said at the beginning, emotions are not inherently, say it with me, sinful. Emotions are not inherently sinful. The object of that emotion, the response that we have to that emotion, that's what determines the sinfulness of it. Okay, don't believe me? You think this is the only time that God says something about hatred? Let's go one verse later, Proverbs 8, 13. To fear the Lord is to strongly dislike evil. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior, and perverse speech. Even hatred, an emotion so complex, and for many of us, one of those things that just like grates at us, right? God himself demonstrates a holy hatred for things that are not supposed to be in this world, right? For people who behave in ways that are ugly and painful and destructive. God himself demonstrates hate. So here's the truth again, just in case you forgot. Emotions are not inherently sinful. However, right, so it doesn't take long to look in Scripture to know that humans do sinful things with emotions, don't they? Right? I mean, think about anger. Cain kills his brother. Why? Because he had anger in his heart, right? One of the oldest sins in the Bible was because of anger towards his brother in his heart. Fear. I mean, Moses runs from God in fear, right? Doesn't he? Like he just takes off out into the wilderness for 40 years out of fear. Moses sinned because of his fear. What about sadness? Think about the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10. We don't have to go there, but in Mark chapter 10, Jesus is having this conversation with the rich young ruler, and he's like, hey, what do I have to do to follow you? Jesus is like, oh, keep all the commandments, basically. I'm, I'm giving you an interpretation, right? Follow all the commandments. And he's like, yeah, I did all that. And then, God, then Jesus says to the man, remember, rich man, says to him, hey, um, then give everything you have. and Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. And it says that he walked away sad. Because he had great wealth. You see, his, the sadness that he had about losing the things that, he, that mattered most to him kept him from following Jesus. So what's the difference? Okay, What is the difference between the anger that Jesus displayed flipping the tables in the temple and the anger that Cain displayed in killing his own brother? Why, is, why does one anger have the result of holiness and righteousness and the other anger have the result of sin and death? Well, the difference is in 1 Peter chapter 2. It says that he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Now look at this for a minute. Verse 23. When they hurled their insults at him, that being Jesus, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, 
This is the difference right here. The difference between Cain's hatred of his brother that led to death and Jesus' hatred of the money changers in the temple that led to life is right here. Jesus entrusted himself to him who judges justly. The difference is in those two behaviors that, ex- that Jesus experienced the fullness of the emotions that you and I experience, right? Philippians chapter 2 is like all talks about how Jesus became one of us, right? And took on that full human form, including emotions. He experienced anger and sadness, but he did not use them as an excuse to sin because he trusted, entrusted himself to the God, to his heavenly Father who judges justly. Friends, I take so much comfort in knowing that we have a Savior who was full of emotions and yet empty of sin. Jesus was full of emotions and yet completely empty of sin. So the second point I want to share with you is that by inviting Jesus into our emotions, we have the opportunity to become more like him. First point, emotions are not inherently sinful. But the second one is that by inviting Jesus into our emotional lives, into those complex emotions, whether they be the core ones or the ones that we believe in our whole lives that we're not supposed to demonstrate or experience, right? Inviting Jesus into our emotional health and our emotional lives, we have the opportunity to become more like him. That's discipleship. That's what it means to know and follow Jesus, not just with our heads and not just with our mouths and not just with our hands, but with our hearts, the fullness of our emotions. But we have to invite him into our emotional lives, don't we? Just like every other aspect, we have to invite Jesus into the decisions of how we spend our money, how we spend our time, how we handle relationships. This is the exact same concept that in order to follow Jesus, to know and live like Jesus, to be a disciple of Jesus, We have to choose to invite him into our emotional lives and give us the opportunity to become more like him. Even as Jesus did, entrusting himself to the one who judges justly, the Savior who was full of emotion and yet without sin. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 6. It says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin. Remember what Jesus just, I mean, 1 Peter 2.23, that like, he had people beating him up and mocking him and making fun of him, put him down, literally physically torturing him, and he did nothing in response to hurt them back. Right? Paul is saying, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your immortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Emotions in and of themselves are not sinful. What we do with those emotions determines whether or not they become sin in our lives. And so this is the process of emotionally healthy discipleship in one verse. Inviting Jesus into our emotions so that we do not allow sin to reign in our mortal bodies and those evil desires. Those emotions that all of us have that are, that are not inherently evil but can become evil depending on the focus of our hearts and the focus of our mind. How we respond to that emotion determines whether or not we live like Jesus whether or not we love like Jesus, whether or not we serve like Jesus, by inviting him into our emotional lives. 2 Peter 1.3 says that his divine power, this is Jesus, right? so when we invite him into our emotional lives, his divine power has given us everything that we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Everything that we need, including our emotional health. Sometimes we kind of set that aside, right? But what Peter is reminding us is that through a relationship with Jesus, by inviting him into our emotionality, these complex things of who we are, the core of what we believe about ourselves, that Jesus gives us everything that we need for a life of godliness. So here's the two core principles that will serve as the foundation for this entire series, that emotions are not inherently sinful, and number two, that by inviting Jesus into our emotions, we have the opportunity to be more like him. And friends, it is impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. They don't exist. 
Spiritual maturity and emotional maturity go hand in hand. And so would you join me in inviting Jesus into our emotional lives? So uh, what do we do now? Okay. Now what? Well, join us on the next six weeks in this journey. If you don't have a life group, consider potentially joining one because in the context of life groups, we're going to be talking about emotional health and specifically this book. But I've got one challenge for you before you leave today. If something's stirring in you, if, if there's like this, this acknowledgement at least inside of you that goes, hey, I, I'm not sure I fully understand this whole emotional health thing. I'm not sure I invite Jesus regularly into my emotional life, right? If, if, if God's kind of like working in your heart right now and, and you want to kind of start a journey with me, I have, a, I have a suggestion for you, a very specific way that you can respond today. And that is to create an emotionally, an emotional health journal, okay? It's up to you how often you do it. You want to do it daily. You want to do it a couple times a day. You want to do it once a week, whatever you want to do. But give yourself permission. Get, go out. You can either buy it or um, put it in your phone or however you want to do it. Some people, um, my wife specifically, she loves those like really cool journals with the like pretty stuff on the outside. Um, so go out and get a brand new journal and give yourself permission to ask yourself three questions on a regular basis. Number one, what emotions did I feel? Because emotional health starts with acknowledging all of the emotions. And for many of us, because we have good emotions and bad emotions, we don't let ourselves feel certain things. That's just the reality. But giving yourself permission to experience the fullness of emotions, ask yourself, just write, just list them. You don't have to get like, you know, write a book, but just list it. What emotions did I experience today? Second question, how did I respond? Remember, like there's three core components to emotions, external stimulus, physiological response, reaction, and then a behavioral response, right? So then what did I feel? How did I respond? And then the last question, where did I experience Jesus in the midst of my emotions today? All I'm asking you to do is to begin to develop a greater level of awareness of both the emotions you're experiencing and where Jesus wants to meet you in the midst of those. That's all I'm asking because this is a lifelong journey. Emotional health, just like discipleship of Jesus, is a lifelong journey. The emotional health component of our, of our journey with Christ, it, it is a long process. But it starts with awareness. It starts with asking ourselves the hard questions. What did I feel today? How did I respond? And where was Jesus in the midst of that? I mentioned also, if you'd like to take home the um, life group study guide, there's one um, at the back at the ministry table on your way out. It'll give you some further ideas for study. It gives you um, some resources there as well. Even if you're not part of a life group, um, we're going to give you those throughout this six-week um, process. You can kind of do your own life group at home if you want to. But consider, in this journey, creating an emotional health journal that would give yourself a safe place to just process. What are the emotions? How did I respond? And where is Jesus in the midst of that? Because it is impossible to remain emotionally immature while trying to be spiritually mature. It just doesn't exist. Can I pray for us? Jesus, um, there's so many complex experiences and emotions represented throughout this room and online today. People who've got um, deep and complex stories. And Father, the, the truth is, for most of my life, um, Emotional health was, was kind of kept separate from following you. God, for most of my life, what mattered was about what I said or what I did or what I thought. But many of us, many of us were waking up to this reality that we need you. We need you to disciple our emotions to help us understand what we're experiencing and to invite you into it so that we might know and live like you, that we might become more like you, Jesus, in every aspect of our lives. So would you empower this journey, we pray. Would you empower the men and women and children in this room today on this journey to ask the hard questions, to create safe space, to explore their emotions and what it means to follow you in the midst of them. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessings.